we have done four lessons, and all of them have been on the theme that once saved, always saved. Once you're sanctified, you're always sanctified. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You know why? Because you don't save yourself. <laughs> you're saved by the grace of God through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift. If you're confirmed, you're confirmed to the end. You understand that? But don't miss this. By whom? Are you responsible? Now, according to Paul, let me, start, let me read it again. Here's verse 6. Even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. That's the gospel business. Verse 8. The, our Lord Jesus Christ shall also confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, theologically, we call it the rapture. Confirmed. Salvation, confirmed to the end, blameless. Confirmed on both ends, blameless. Both ends. Because of grace. Because of grace. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. It's, it's, it's not uh, hold on and wish for the best at the end. He already tells you what the end's going to be. If you're in Christ, Christ confirms you to the end. And he does it. He confirms you blameless. That's without judicial guilt. That's legal. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get into this study. <laughs> Confirmed. To the end. Confirm to the end. A lot of people have that trouble with that idea, and we're going to clear that up tonight, today. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, overt sins. You confess them, 1 John 1, 9. You confess your sins, not to, not, not to be store, restored to salvation but to be restored to spirituality. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the name of the game. I mean, you can't be spiritual without him. <laughs> you can't. Your spiritual life is all about walking in the dynamics of the power of the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, where when you do, the presence, his presence just becomes overwhelming to who you are. W listen, when you walk in the Spirit, your mind is preoccupied with him with the Lord instead of with yourself. Do you know that? Me, do you know that experience? That's called walking in the spiritual, in, spirit, in the spirit, in Galatians 5.16. Do you know that? I mean, do you know it in your spirit? I mean, people go like, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm spiritual or not. Sure you do. You know the difference of you talking to you and you talking to the Lord? The power of the Holy Spirit is to bring the witness of Christ strongly into your soul so that you just can't help but telling other people the joy you have in the journey with Christ. Well, 1 John 1, 9 is a key passage to bring you back to spirituality, carnality, evidence of the flesh. Carnality, evidence of the flesh operating out of the flesh or the sin nature. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins... The faithfulness of God is employed. <clears throat> the faithfulness of God is to forgive me and cleanse me. Work of Christ from the cross extended to the Christian life in spirituality. Boom, there I am. Do you know that? Shouldn't have to wait to the end of the day, confess sin. You should confess it whenever, whenever you're aware of it. You're going to be aware of it because you have a conscience that would say it if the word of God is in your conscience. If you're building a conscience out of the word of God, the word of God will tell you, whoa, whoa. <laughs> In fact, it'll tell you ahead of time. Whoa. It'll tell you on the backside, let's get back to the game, <clears throat> and you'll need to confess your sin. Your conscience will tell you, the Word of God will tell you, the Holy Spirit will tell you, and if you have a good friend, he'll tell you. <laughs> and you may not like all of those witnesses to you. So I gave you a moment of silence through your priesthood to confess sin, if necessary, so that John 14, 26, the, the Holy Spirit can teach and recall the truth of the Word of God to your soul in those times when you're in desperate need. 
and in the times when you're not, when somebody else is. <laughs> Take a moment. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. By the automobile and by the internet, I want to thank you, Father, for all the wonderful people that make this a grace luncheon and, and ministry. The grace benefactors of encouraging people, people at midday of the middle of a week and a midday of the work, able to come in and sit down and have a good meal and study the word of God and be refueled to go back out there <clears throat> and live their life as unto the Lord. Encourage our hearts today, Father, with confirmed to the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to look at four ideas today on this idea of being confirmed. <clears throat> I'm after you grasping the concept that you're confirmed to the end <laughs> because a lot of people don't believe that. But the Word of God is very clear about it. <clears throat> and here's a great passage on it, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter 6 and 6 through 8. I want to thank you for coming out on Wednesday and for the, all the people that make this possible. Listen, encourage your friends to come. That person that says, I find it difficult to drive at night, bring them in the daytime. That's why we're running this deal. Uh, bring them in. We'll feed them. If we run out of food, we'll go get some. Well, you'll be fed. If we have to create five loaves and two fish, we'll do this thing. Uh, so we just, this is for you. It's not for us. This is for you. This is a midday refueling, midair. <laughs> it's always amazing to watch these planes refuel in the middle of the air, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of what I feel this is for us. I, well, number one, number one. I want to begin by pointing out three doctrinal reasons in our passage 6, 7, and 8 uh, uh, that, re that Paul was so thankful to God for the Corinthian believers, how his life had touched theirs and how their life touched his. I've tried to, I try to tell my people more often, and I should tell them more, how thankful I am that my life touched yours that my life touched yours. And when I see your life being lived by the power of God through the word and the spirit, it just brings me great joy. It brings me great joy that our lives have touched each other in a special way. And that, but Paul had that. Paul had that wonderful experience with every place he went. And listen, if you have great ministry in the Lord, wherever you go and where, whatever lives you touch, they are forever in you, aren't they? You'll never forget them until you lose your memory, right? <laughs> and I'm learning that's possible. <laughs> I don't know how deep that goes in your life, but I am learning it. Uh, so let me show you three things he's thankful for that's related to my lesson today. First, he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ. In the Greek language, the word in plus the locative is a locative of position. The locative of position. It could be a locative of place or position or person. Here it is a person, but I called it position because of positional sanctification. We studied this here on Wednesday. Would you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, uh, 3 and 4. When you believe that, Romans 1, 16, when you believe that, the Holy Spirit baptizes you, church age, new covenant, into Christ. Into Christ. He baptized you into Christ. Galatians uh, 3, 27. He baptized you into Christ. At the same time that he baptizes you into Christ, he baptizes you into the body of Christ. Did you know that? Boy, these are two points you better get. He baptizes you. At this point, he the Holy Spirit baptizes Christ. Christ baptizes you in the, into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We're studying this on Sunday, by the way. So, 
my point. <laughs> in Christ. How do I get in Christ? Listen to what Paul says. I mean, what, you're just going to make up your own idea? I thank my God always can you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ. That's, that's in plus the locative in the Greek language. That's in plus the locative of sphere or in Christ. We call it position. Into We call it positional sanctification. Sanctification means that you've been set apart, set apart under the holiness of God. Just think about that. I, you should write this verse down, and you should really look at this because nobody's telling you this. 1 Peter 1.4. It says the moment that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you receive a divine nature. Think about that. You receive a divine nature. Jesus called it to Nicodemus. He called it being born again. And without it, you cannot see. But after you have it, you can see the things of God. You can, you can handle the things of God. You enter into that dy dynamics of spiritual place. The moment you believe the gospel, you are born again. You are born with a divine nature to connect you to God who is your heavenly father. How about that? You said, where was that, Ron? Now you're interested. 2 Peter 1.4. <laughs> In Christ. 2 Peter 1.4. Did I say 1 Peter? Well, it's probably, probably, you ought to probably put that down too. That, might, that actually might have been a better point than the one I got. I don't know. But uh, you always know that when I give you numbers, you better check them. <laughs> they get backwards a lot. They get backwards a lot. Second uh, Peter 1, 4, thank you. Listen, he said, I thank my God always concerning you. In other words, he can do it all the time because he knows this is permanent. I can thank you Monday and I can thank you Friday because this permanent is not based on you. <laughs> A lot of things have changed in life between Monday and... I, I'll tell you, as a pastor, a lot of things change in people's life from Sunday to Monday, <laughs> let alone to Friday, because it all gets all started again by Friday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I got my hands full on Sunday just because of the weekend. Positional sanctification. In the Bible, we refer to the plan of God in three phases. We call it phase one, phase two, and phase three. Just a simple way to remember it. Phase one is salvation. Phase two is the Christian way of life. Phase three is eternity. You know, to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. Okay? Or, to be, or to be raptured and present with the Lord. I mean, if you don't die, you, you know, and he who is alive and remains shall be caught up and changed. Boom! That would be an experience, wouldn't it? Without dying. How does that work? <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. It didn't even work with Jesus. Right? He had to die, but he died for the right reason, you and I. Uh, now, here's the second thing. That positional sanctification is really important in Christ. He says, even as the testimony. See the word to? That's a definite article. Say martyreran. See martyreran. That's the word testimony or martyr. A, a testimony that could kill you. A testimony that could, that could bring death to you. That, that, so this word in the English became martyr. I tell you, the early church, very few people got out of here without being martyred. We don't even know what that is. I mean, we've been so blessed in America. We have been so blessed in America. Well, even as the testimony, notice there's the definite article, concerning Christ. The testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You know what that is? That's Paul teaching them what their salvation is about. That's milk doctrines. Newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. This is Hebrews 5, 13, and 14. Babies, babies need milk and mature people need meat or 
uh, solid food. We're a solid food teaching church. There's no doubt about that. We're, that. That's what God called me to do. There's no doubt that we are that. Uh, and, and, and he says, even as the testimony concerning Christ, that is the salvation, the whole message. You know, we call it the 50 things you receive in time and you, that you can never lose in time and eternity. Well, you need to get that little pamphlet. If you don't have it, you should study it like crazy because that is your life. <laughs> even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. That's, we call that progressive sanctification. That's the Christian life. Lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lived in the power of the Word of God by faith. Right? There's where you find that your calling is worthy. In that Ephesians 4.1. And here's a verse you ought to put on your paper underneath this, progressive sanctification, where you see that, that phase two. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. How, how, how is this confirmed in you? And it's going to be confirmed in you to the end. Well, one of the ways is the testimony confirmed. The testimony that's confirmed is the teaching of the Word of God in you. Something you can testify to others about, like I'm doing right now with you. Opening the word of God and going like, this is, wow, look at this. Who knew? Who knew we had that until we opened the Bible? Who knew it? Well, we opened the Bible, they go like, wow, confirmed. We'll talk about that in a minute, what that means. Confirmed in, notice that's plural. The you is plural. Come on, Southern. Y'all. But in 2 Peter 3.18, it, uh, uh, it says, grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's talking about. Well, how does that come? Well, it comes by, going, by studying the Bible filled with the Holy Spirit and then living it under the power of the Holy Spirit where you're able to walk it out in faith, not, not based on anything going on in your life. Circumstances don't determine it but rather the walking of faith, not sight, right? The walking of faith and not walking by sight. So it's easy to walk by sight. You understand? But it don't work for the kingdom. The whole world, the whole world walks by sight, and they're blind. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4, 3, and 4, and they're blind. And they're blind. Yeah, they think they're blind people think they can see. How crazy is that? Listen, our spiritual eyes have been opened. We've got, we operate under Ephesians 1.18. We have spiritual eyes in our soul because we've been born again. The third thing that Paul says that I felt was important, when he says, who shall confirm you to the end, He's talking about the who is the Lord Jesus Christ from verse 7. Who shall also. See, I got the testimony of Christ confirming me, right? I got saved. I got into confirmation. I was confirmed in Christ. I have the testimony of Christ. The whole idea of confirmation, the beginning, the middle, and plan one, you know, phase one, two, and three. And he's teaching all of that here. He's got phase one, phase two, and phase three all in this thing. And the testimony it, is that. I, I, I can learn that, I know that, and I can live it. Isn't that wonderful? That is so good. The Lord Jesus Christ shall also confirm you to the end. You know what's interesting to me? That's church history. One part of that end is church history. Church history will have an end. And it's called the rapture. We call it the rapture. And church history will be removed from the earth dramatically. <laughs> and no building will go up. It will only be people. Not one, not one church Building will go up. 
and yet the entire church is removed. So it tells you it's who goes to the building, not the building. Right? Sometimes, sometimes we don't get that, but that's not my problem. <laughs> who shall also confirm you to the end. Now, now, how are you going to be confirmed to the end? Watch this. Something that started in salvation, moving through the Christian life, is now at the end. At the end of church history. Blameless. <laughs> Blameless. Blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we call the rapture. This is N plus a locative of time. How do I know that? Because the word day. Right? <laughs> what day is it? What time of the day is it? And we're talking time. Rapture. And we call that permanent sanctification. I, I like P words. See, I, positional, progressive, permanent. I didn't learn that theology. I just, that's to pass a test. <laughs> I was just, I, I was just to pass a test. Uh, but it stuck with me, you know. Like sometimes you have to be careful. Remember, you associate names, people's names with s something. It can really get crazy because at some point, maybe that's something you compared them to. They might not want to be, they might not want to hear. <laughs> right? So what we have in this word confirmed is phase one, two, and three, right? Phase one, two, and three. We call it positional sanctification, progressive sanctification. But here's here's the secret. If you've got if you've got one, which is in verse six, you automatically have three, which is in verse eight. Because they're both in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? My salvation confirmed when I believed the gospel of Jesus. You're not going to get it any other way now. Look, he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. That is the gospel. When you believe the gospel, the power to save you is in the gospel. Romans 1.16. Therefore, you can say with testimony in you, I was saved by grace through faith and not of myself. It is a gift of God. Isn't that wonderful? That's the testimony of your confirmation of salvation. You ought to learn those three verses for sure, shouldn't you? And next time somebody tells you, I don't think you can be saved to the end, open up your Bible and give them 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 6, 7, and 8. <laughs> Point number two. In our lesson text, Paul gave three, a threefold confirmation of the gospel of grace salvation concerning the Corinthians believers whom he's concerned with. For example, he used the word confirmation in verse 6 in the concept of eternal redemption. Let me give you a Bible verse right there on your paper. Notice on your paper, I wrote down Hebrews 9.12. Now listen to what Hebrews 9.12 says. You know, the first 10 chapters of Hebrews is all about the old covenant out and the new covenant in. The whole shooting match. We just, we just went through 8, 9, and 10 here a while back. Listen to what he says. This is the writer of Hebrews. Not through blood of goats and calves, that's old covenant, shadow Christology, but through. Notice, not through, but through. Do you see that? I bold printed it for you. Not through, but through. But through his own blood, this is John 129, 29, you know, John 129, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. He entered the holy place, heaven, according to Hebrews. Heaven, how many times? Once for all. That death on the cross is once for all. That burial is once for all. The resurrection is once for all. You, when you enter that salvation, it's once for all. You're, you're confirmed, saved. Name, is, name can never be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life, baby. Never can be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life. Confirmed. Confirmed how long? To the end. You know why? Grace. Grace is the work of the love of God through the justice received by Jesus Christ, work on the cross. 
that accomplishes it for us. It's a wonderful idea. And listen how he describes it. Once for all, watch this, having obtained eternal redemption. When you get saved, believe the gospel, you enter into eternal redemption in Christ. When you, when you wind up in Christ, you wind up in eternal redemption. Boom, there it is. And you are confirmed to the end. I love this. This is so good. For it is only right, Paul says in Philippians 1, 7, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you. Now he's talking to the Philippians. Because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace. When I wrote that, I can't believe I missed the words of grace. I wrote it in. I didn't catch it until I was going over my notes before I came here. I had my wife proofread, and she went, that don't make sense. There's something missing there. And I said, I think God left that out deliberately for me to emphasize the importance of grace. I don't think he did. Tell you. I think I just <laughs> overlooked it. <laughs> Philippians, listen, you, the gospel, the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. You know, Paul talks about his conversion in 1 Timothy 1.15 in just the most bold terms. So that's one thing, confirmation of eternal redemption. In verse 7, he talks about spiritually gifted ministries working in the church. We're doing a study on that on Sundays right now, out of chapters 12, 13, and 14. And the confirmation, say that's phase two. And then in verse 8, the confirmation blameless. Now I broke this word down for you in the Greek language because it's just interesting. I, I, I know you, you know, you just, it's okay. I'm driven by the language. You don't have to be. <laughs> but I'm driven enough that I have to talk about it. This is the most interesting word, the word blameless. I broke this word down for you. The A on the front of that word, we call it an alpha privative. It means without. It would be, it, it just strictly means without, or, or in English, you put a U-N in front of the word. Unblemished or something. The N is used to separate two vowels in the Greek language. So you have an A and an E. That's put there. And then you have the actual word. You have the alpha privet on it. You have an N there that says, beware, we have two vowels. One's an alpha privet and the other goes with the word. See, God knew there would be guys going through Greek language like me that would have to have that. Then you have ekletos. Ekletos is the word. Blame. Here's the word. Blame. Less. There it is. Alpha privative. Blame less. Blame less. The importance of this word in context means without judicial guilt of Adam's sin. When you read when you read the book of Romans, for example, the first five chapters, boy, Paul, Paul shows you what a mess you are because you were born to human being. <laughs> right? Adam's sin got passed down to the human race and death by sin, and so it passed upon all human beings. And he goes into great details about, about the 13 judicial judgments carried in that. Everybody's under this charge and needs to be redeemed. So he uses this word blameless, confirmed blameless, if you, once a moment you get saved, those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin are removed from your life and can never be charged again for them. Never. 
because of the work of Christ. One death for all sin for all time. Otherwise, you know, the law of double jeopardy business would be there. They, we'd be in a court arguing. Now, Jesus to Nicodemus in John the third chapter, verse 18 and 19 and verse 36, he goes over this with Nicodemus, who is supposed to be a learned person of the law. I mean, he was teaching other people. He was a professor of the law. And so he reminds him of the judicial judgment of Adam's original sin. And he says everybody's under condemnation. Verses 18 and 19. And he warns in verse 19, to, warns Nicodemus, rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ is a very dangerous thing. And you shouldn't be teaching that you can get to, you can get to heaven any way you want to go. Now, if you just keep the law and be a good old boy, you'll get there. It'll take you a while. <laughs> and you just better hope you get there. They said, no, listen, listen, don't do that. And then back in 36, he comes in and he says, you're under judgment. He says, you're under condemnation. In verse 18, he says, you're under condemnation because of Adam's sin. And you are until Jesus Christ removes it. And if he doesn't remove it, it'll never happen. He would say to Nicodemus, you know the Messiah is coming for that reason. Now, what was it? Why did you come to see me, Nicodemus? Oh, you like my teaching. Well, we'll see how it works after today. <laughs> because today we're going to get personal with it. Yeah. Oh, John Haggai, when he got personal with me on it, so, and then in verse 36, he talks about raft. He says, you're under the raft. All people are under raft, not because of what they're doing. They're under the raft of God because of Adam's sin. You say, well, that's not fair. I, I know. Look, at you have to talk all that out with God and Eve and Adam when you get there. <laughs> My wife says she's going to have a long talk with Eve. <laughs> A whole lot of stuff flew, uh, flowed down through Eve to her, and she's going to have a serious talk with her. Uh, well, okay. I, I don't have no idea about all that stuff. In Romans, the eighth chapter, for us under the new covenant, we're told that in Christ there is no condemnation. No condemnation in Christ. None. Don't let, put it, don't let people put any in there either. Because there is none. All of that has been put on Christ on the cross. When he was raised from the dead, it's over. No condemnation. Romans 8th chapter. And he uses an interesting word. I just have to put it there. It's kata, which is a preposition, and krema. This is an interesting word. And it's, it's used by Paul a great deal as well as like Romans 8 and Romans 5. And it means, this word in judgment means that once acquittal, you can never be called to that charge ever again. Can never be called to account again for that charge. Any charge under Adam's sin that has, was applied to you when you believe the gospel was removed from your life forever. Confirmed, blameless to the end. Without any judicial guilt of Adam's sin upon your life. None. So don't let anybody put it on you. Okay? All right? Confirmed unto the end or until the rapture. I put down Colossians 1. I want you to add verse 20 to it. I put 21 and 22, but I, I, you should put 20 in it. And you should read it because we have the word blameless. The idea. Now, point number three. Hey, somebody's got to watch on. Keep me. Oh, that, 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 I got a, I know, but I'm going to have to get a bigger clock. <laughs> 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 
Or like John Dyer, he didn't get it bigger. He put it in red. Well, he did pay, make it bigger too, but he put it in red. I can see that red thing if I can remember where it is. Huh? Nah. I got 10 minutes. I, I can see the clock, but I can't tell the time. Most of, m m reason because of the light. <laughs> oh, I got 10 minutes. But I'm going to get you out of here at 12.30. Paul, you, it, even if somebody has to pull the trap door and get rid of me. <laughs> Paul used the Greek verb. Watch this. Bane no, no o. Bane no o. Bane no o. He used a Greek word. Confirm, and he used it twice. And the reason he did to teach us two important doctrinal truths about being confirmed to the end. So I want you to pay attention to Greek grammar. Watch the grammar. In verse 6, even as the, as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed, this is an aorist passive indicative. Now let me tell you what that means. It's really important. The aorist tense is a, as a past time. There's nothing like it in the English language. Nothing. That's what I've been told. I wasn't that good in the English language. I'm better in Greek language under, uh, uh, than I am in the English. But I do know that Eris is a pastime, and it's a reference to grace salvation. Confirmed. At what point in time divorced from time? That's connected with past. Your conversion. When the Paul went on his the trip to and went call of Macedonia and went over over to Corinth and all the other Greek places. That's that's the aorist tense when they got converted. When did they get confirmed? When they heard the gospel and believed it. Aorist tense. When they heard the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 and believed it in Romans 1, 16 and got saved according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Notice, notice all those scriptures came out of Gentile churches and came out of Paul's ministry to them. The passive voice is what we call the voice of grace or something working outside of you towards you or towards whatever the end of the verb was. And confirmed. Confirmed. The passive voice, the actual passive voice activity is baptism of the Holy Spirit. The moment I believe the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16, I was baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, Galatians 3.27. That's the mechanics. That's the grace. Grace is the baptism of Christ, placing you into position in Christ, confirmed until the end. If you're in Christ, you're in the end. The I end without another end in it. <clears throat> the indicative is the testimony of the word of God, <clears throat> where assurance comes. The indicative mood is the testimony of being confirmed in Christ scripturally. I mean, where does the assurance <clears throat> that you are confirmed to the end come from? Word of God, right? You didn't get it from some bird coming over and having a talk with you in the morning as you're having a cup of coffee on your deck. Huh? Well, somebody might have told you they got it that way, but we, we got to see it in the Word. We got to see it in the Word. Your assurance comes from the truth of the Word of God regarding the subject. How do I know that? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Or as one person reminded me the other day, the word of Christ. I said, well, that's ex actually what it says. But we know that if Christ says it comes from God, if the Holy Spirit says we know it comes from God, so I'm okay with it, it you know. Here in verse 8, who the Lord Jesus Christ will also confirm Notice this time, the same word confirmed is used differently in the Greek grammar. He wouldn't even have told me to the end. It's a future for my salvation. Aorist tense is salvation. Future tense is something after my salvation. Future from the point I got saved. And so here's what, the, here's what God is trying to tell you. Future active indicative it, and you're confirmed 
He confirms you to the end. The Lord Jesus Christ confirms you. You don't confirm yourself. I don't confirm you. A whole church can't get to inform you. If five churches couldn't get together to do it, only God can do this. This is done by grace through Jesus Christ. And, and the future tense is a future time. The end will come when the rapture does, when the church is removed from the earth. The active voice is the Lord Jesus Christ will confirm. It is him. The, the Lord Jesus Christ will confirm you. He confirms you. He confirms you. When that book, when that last book of life is opened and the book of works is open, you're going to be glad you're in that book. You'll be glad you're in that book. And you're there by the grace of God. Confirmed, future, active. That's positional sanctification in Christ. And you're there, you're there to the end, permanent. The indicative mood is confirming to the end a reality of God's promise. Listen, what God has promised you, he will do. Romans 4.21. You don't have to have the promise fulfilled. How many times do you have to have a promise fulfilled to know that God fulfills them? That he does what he's promised. Right? Well, I don't know. He gave me 26,000, but how, how do I know? Well, 26,000 ought to be pretty good proof when he says, whatever I promised, I will perform. To the end. <laughs> I mean, how much proof do you want? I mean, we're like people that just got, he's got to remind me every day. I mean, how many times has he done this? 26 million times. Oh, well, probably this next one. I need one more to believe. <laughs> well, have you actually kept up with all these things? No, but I need one more to believe. In our lesson text, this is good to go home with, point number four. In our lesson text, Paul is teaching that the church age will end, that there's actually an end. It began at Pentecost, it will end in the rapture. It will end in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8. We in theology call this rapture, which is a Latin word for being caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up future passive indicative, together with them in the cloud. Together with who? Who is the them? Well, they're the believers who have died and gone to be with the Lord, to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. They're going to come with him in the cloud, those who have preceded us, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the cloud or in the sky. We're talking about, we're talking about Acts 1.11. We're talking about Acts 111. We're talking about Acts 111. Listen, if people knew what they were looking for, they could probably see it. Think how long you can, you can see the spaceship. And when he talks about when he went up in the cloud, right? In the cloud, they, they saw them. It, they, they saw him leave. They testified, we saw him leave. He said, in the same way, I shall return. You know? It's going to be spectacular, I suppose. And listen, no matter how high you go up, when they can't see you here, he sees you there. How good is that? Notice also, it's a future passive indicative. The future time of the rapture. It's interesting that the word the word transformed, uh, let's say, together with a cloud with them, and so shall we always be with the Lord, caught up. When Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, and 54, 51 through 58, he's talking about your resurrection body will be changed. Your, your, your body is going to be alive at the rapture and is going to be changed without you dying. Oh, I hope there's some, I hope there's some professors of science in that business <laughs> who go like, oh, oh Ben.
Now, will that blow their mind? It is an interesting word because what we have in this picture is the, the body of the believers, the temple of the Lord. Agreed? Got to go. And it's going to be changed to a resurrection body like Christ. There you go. Worth your read. Worth your read. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Let's have a word of prayer and I'll get you out of here. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this to our souls. May we come, Father, to see with our spiritual eyes for enlightenment and revelation in our Christian life. And may we understand it simply enough as we study it over and over to be able to communicate it to others who have never heard it and are struggling in their life on whether they are confirmed or not confirmed to the end. This would certainly, certainly level that playing field of misunderstanding. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.